Open your Bibles tonight to Psalm chapter 5 and verse number 1. We're going to begin reading at the front of that psalm. And while you're turning there, I want to read you some verses out of Habakkuk chapter 3 while you're finding that. He said, Though the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive tree shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. That's a bad situation, isn't it? Yet, <laughs> yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He said, the Lord is my strength. He'll make my feet like hind's feet, and he'll make me to walk upon my high places. I like it when God gets us up in those high places, don't you? And so that's Habakkuk, but let's begin reading Psalm 5, verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King, my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up. That's what we need to do more of, is looking up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. Boy, I'm waved around the night in the mercy and the grace of God. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies, and make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth, or inward parts very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Now here he prays, an, this is what we call an imprecatory psalm. He prays the wrath of God down on his enemy. He said, destroy them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgression, for they have rebelled against thee. But look at verse number 11. But let all of those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever, not occasionally, not spasmodically, <laughs> but let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them that also love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him about as a shield. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless tonight as we preach. We're dependent on the Holy Ghost. For realize, Lord, without the Spirit of God, we're not able to do anything, but through him we can do whatever you called us to do. We thank you, Lord, for Woodland Baptist Church. Thank you for Brother Tim. Thank you for the influence that this church has had in years gone by and is having now. And Lord, I pray that on into the future. Now help us tonight. I'm dependent upon you as I preach, and I'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach to you a little while tonight on reasons to rejoice. Now this is a topical message, and you have to be careful on the topical message that you don't take an hour and a half. And I know I don't have that kind of time. But uh, I want you to see tonight how we need to come out of our sadness and get into gladness. I've lived on the earth a little over 73 years now, but I've never seen as many sad people as I'm seeing today. They look like the dishwashers quit and uh, the washing machines quit and the refrigerator, and all three of them's not working at the same time. That's the way the average Baptist look. And most people seem to be pouting instead of shouting. They're grumbling instead of glorying. They're mad instead of glad. They're irritated instead of satisfied. They're disturbed rather than calm. They're defiant rather than compliant. And under the circumstances uh, is where most people are today. We need to get above the circumstances. I saw a fellow some time back. I hadn't seen him in a while. I said, how are you doing? And he said, well, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. I said, whoa, 
You're not to be under the circumstances. By the grace of God, you're to be on top of them. Some people are like the fellow looked at another fellow and said, why are you sad? And he said, well, I don't have any reason. I'm just sad. Well, I want to go on record tonight to say I've got all kind of reasons. I mean to be glad, and that word joy and gladness has the idea of twirling around for joy, jumping up and down for joy. Brother, we need to get more like those old-fashioned Baptist churches were. They shouted over the singing. They shouted over the preaching. And God help us to not be ashamed of our relationship to the Lord. We're to rejoice in the Lord. The word rejoice is used in this form, rejoice, 192 times. It's rejoiced, E-D, 47 times. Rejoiceth one time. And then rejoicing 28 times. And uh, one time, another form, if you total that up, there are 286 times. If something's mentioned in the Bible one time, you better take heed to it. You better be careful about your obedience to it. But if it totals up to 286 times, then we dare not miss it. The word shout talks about crying out, shouting for joy, giving a ringing cry, and brother, we need more cries, ringing cries in our churches today. I'm glad you've got a good pastor, but the problem with a lot of these churches are they've got uh, iceberg preachers and their icicles hanging in the pew. I love to hear people rejoice and if it's the real deal, if it's the real deal. Before I went to Zion Hill, I pastored at Oxford Memorial Baptist Church in Taylorsville. And I, I went, uh, first of all, I went and they had a supply pastor that had been there. And really, he led them into what I would call a liberal practice church. Now, God moved through the years. And while I went, I went there and they began to open up and worship God. And I'd preach my heart out and I'd hear an amen once in a while. There's a man in the church came to me, one of my deacons. He came to me one Sunday morning and he said, Preacher, when I hear the singing, when I hear the preaching, I feel uh, something inside, and I don't know what to do. I just feel like shouting. My response was, brother, help yourself. Just let it out. And that day he started shouting, and today it's never stopped. Brother Tim, when he shouts, he sounds like a Comanche Indian on the warpath. And it's never stopped through the year. And when he began to praise God, I wasn't the only one rejoicing. There's some others got in on him. Heard about a woman praising the Lord in church, and she'd lift both hands unto God and praise the Lord. Well, her little child one day said, Mama, who are you waving at when you lift your hands? She said, Honey, I'm just waving at Jesus. And that's what it's all about. Thank God. A woman told me years ago, I get nervous when people shout. I said, what are you going to do when you get to heaven? And hear hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Is that going to make you nervous? Well, she didn't have an answer to that. But I believe that uh, God's people ought to rejoice. There are ample reasons to rejoice. I want to say first of all, tonight, <laughs> glory to God. I feel glory in my soul like a basketball swimming up. I'm glad tonight I don't, I don't, I'm saved I, and I'm rejoicing because I don't have to go to hell. I'm not going to hell. No, no, I'm hell proof and Holy Ghost sealed uh, and I'm as sure as heaven as though I were already there. It's a real place. It's not a place of our imagination. It's as real as Winston-Salem and Greensboro and Charlotte and Asheville or Nashville. It's a real place. Then it's a wicked place. Somebody said hell is a garbage dump of eternity. It's a home of the devil. It's a home of the Hitlers and the Stalins and all who go against the Lord Jesus. It's a home of drunkards and sexual perverts and criminals and gangsters and thugs and all unbelievers will be in hell. The worst of sinners will be put there. Had a fellow tell me some time back, he said, I got buddies in hell. And he said, when I go, we're going to have a party. I don't think so. Oh, there'll be those that were religious. 
And they'll say, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works? And have we not even cast out demons in your name? And the Lord will say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not like he knew them one time and didn't know them. He said, I never knew you. So the dregs of humanity will be found in that place called hell. And I say hallelujah tonight. I'm glad I'm not going there. Hallelujah. It's a torturous place. The fire will be so intense. People will scream and cry. And they'll gnash with their teeth and crunch their teeth together. And part of the worst of it will be memory. The Bible said in hell the worm dieth not. Now, some preachers preach that those are literal worms. I believe, as D.L. Moody did, it's the conscience and the mind, and forever people will live with their rejection of Jesus. They'll remember that meeting where they heard the gospel preached and could have been saved and didn't do it, and they'll remember, and there's not one drop of water in hell. Luke 16 tells us that. No relief, no exit signs. All chances of relief are gone and it'll never change. I'm saying no sin or nobody is worth going to hell over. Jesus said, what is a man profited if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? There's pleasure in sin, but it's only for a season and then you have to face the consequences of it. I don't have to go to hell. <laughs> Glory to God, I'm rejoicing tonight because I'm heaven bound and hell proof. I'm not going to that awful place and that's something to shout over. I'm rejoicing. Hallelujah. I'm not going to hell. I want to say second tonight, I believe we ought to rejoice because our names are written down in heaven. You remember when Jesus sent those 70 disciples out and they came back and they rejoiced because devils were subject to Jesus' name. You know what the Lord said to them? He as much as told them, don't rejoice over those demons subject to you. He said rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. My name might be not be on the who's who in this world. I thank God when I die, my funeral will not be nationwide as some people, but that's all beside the point. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The reality of it, saved people have their names written in the Lamb's book. Now it talks in Revelation about names being blotted out of the book. I'm convinced when I put it all together, there are two main books. There's a book of life where everybody born, is born. Their names are in the book of life. And it talks about blotting their name out in Revelation. And it will be as though, though they're in hell, their name is blotted out of the book of the living and it'll be as though they never existed. They'll be in hell with their name taken out of the book. But then there's the Lamb's book of life. I'm thankful that's where my name is. Praise God and the Lamb forever. The reality of it, the difference, I believe there are two books and I'm in the most important book, in the Lamb's book. Thank God. Remember, Jesus doesn't blot people's name out of the book of life. Now, if you just think there's one book, then how do you explain some names being taken out? You're not taken out if you're saved. Brother, you belong to God. Sister, you're the Lord's forever and ever. My name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. When was it written? <laughs> Here's the controversy. Some people say it happened when you got saved. And that might be so. But I believe since God is a God of all knowledge, God knows ahead of time everything is going to happen. And I believe my name was in the Lamb's book before I ever got saved. God knew I was going to get saved. He's a God. Oh, he's so big. He looks at eternity past and eternity present and future, all of it together. God sees it all at one time. One glance. One glimpse. Thank God. So it doesn't matter to me. If you believe your name is written down when you got saved, hallelujah. But I tend to believe uh, it was in the before the foundation of the world, God knew who would be saved. God knew who was, and my name's in the book. Amen. That's the important thing, not the timing of it, but the fact that.
Praise God for the Lamb's book of life. And we rejoice, thirdly, because we can suffer for the Lord. In Acts chapter 5, they had beaten the apostles. And they told them, said, don't speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go free. Well, you know what they did? When they left the council, the Bible says in Acts 5, they departed rejoicing. They were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I never have believed this statement. A lot of people, preachers will get up at the funeral, and they'll talk about somebody, and they'll say, he was the same man, and he never had an enemy in the world. I don't believe that. If you live for God, Jesus gave you a promise. You will suffer persecution. So don't be surprised when it comes your way. It's going to come. Now, why should we rejoice that we're able to suffer for the name of Jesus? Well, we like smooth sailing, don't we? I like for everything in life to go smooth. But how many of you does that happen all the time? Not a one of you can raise your hand. There are bumps we climb on. There are ditches we go through. There are problems in life. Jesus said this in Luke 6. He said, blessed are ye, happier are ye when men shall hate you, when they separate you from their company and reproach you and cast out your name as evil for Jesus' sake. He said, you're a blessed person. Next time most folks at work begin to persecute you for your faith, you say, hallelujah, I'm glad he counted me worthy to suffer for his name. And then Jesus said, rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, behold, your reward is great in heaven. Now, it sounds ridiculous on the surface to a whirling. Why should we rejoice when we suffer? Because it identifies us with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible calls him the suffering servant. And we will never suffer to the extent Jesus did. Never in life. Nobody suffered like he did. But he, he suffered for us. And I'm not ashamed of him. How about you? Oh, no. It identifies us with Christ. And then that God doesn't make us on the mountaintops. God makes you in the valley. It's in the valley, as Dottie Rambo wrote years ago. It's in the valley. He restoreth my soul. I get more benefit from being in the valley than I do shouting over the mountaintop. Uh, in the valley, he restores my soul. You can live righteously and face valleys and shadows. The shepherd in the Old Testament, he'd take his sheep through valleys before they'd ever get to the mountaintop. Praise God for the valley. If it makes me more like Jesus, thank God for the valley. If it makes me walk closer to him, thank God for the valley. If suffering will benefit me, then we should be willing to suffer for his name's sake. You see, it's in the valley. We get God dependent. We stop relying on our own wisdom and rely on the ability and the power and the wisdom of God. Has that been your experience? Had not some of your most beneficial times been when God lets you down into a valley? And in that valley you realize how weak you are how dependent you are, how much you need the Lord, and it makes you more God-dependent in the valley, and you stop relying on your own self. You realize it's going to have to be somebody bigger than you. And in the valley, if it'll get me closer to Jesus, let the valleys come. Amen. Psalm 23 lets us know when we get in the valley, we're not alone. The Lord's with us. Praise God. In the darkest hour, when the going gets tough and we have the dark places, we hear the gentle voice and the footsteps of the divine shepherd. The Lord's saying, just trust me, child. This valley won't last forever. And whether you know it or not, he said, I'm making you in the valley. They're temporal. They don't last forever. Praise God. I'd hate to stay in the valley all my life. But he takes us through the valley. He walks us through the valley. He doesn't leave us alone in there to make it the best we can, uh, but he walks with us, and he doesn't keep us out of the storms, but hallelujah, he walks us through the storm. Glory to God. What do you do when you get in the valley? You better talk to the shepherd. Too many Christians are far from God. 
when the valley comes, they panic. And they walk ten steps behind God, and they pout, and they grumble, and they complain instead of trusting. Let me say this tonight. You never help yourself. You never help anybody else by being a grumbler. Oh, how you doing? Well, there's some people in my church I kind of avoid once in a while. How you doing? Well, my back's hurting, and I've got problem with my foot, and all and all it goes. And finally, it's past church time to start. I have decided before the service starts, I'm going to hang around the pulpit area for a while. You never know what you're going to have. And people in the valley, they have a genuine valley, and they create a valley, and another valley, and you wonder whether they're telling you the truth or not. Draw close to the shepherd in the valley, and then talk to the shepherd in the valley. David said, hear my cry. Oh God, he said in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is nigh to them that have a broken heart and save us such that is of a contrite spirit. Talk to the shepherd in the valley. Don't count sheep. Talk to the shepherd. That's what we need to do in the church. Instead of uh, just counting how many are there all the time, we count at our church, we got a board. Uh, but the best thing to do is to uh, talk to the shepherd. Uh, and if things are not what they ought to be, Tell the shepherd about it. He's the shepherd of the sheep. What do you do when you get in the valley? You keep on walking. You just keep going. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And in the valley, you keep on marching. You keep on the firing line. And the place of the shadows is not a permanent home. No, no. When darkness closes in, just take the next step. And if it looks dark, if you know you're a child of God and you know the Lord with you, just take another step. Just keep on walking in the valley. Don't sit down and suck and put your hands over your head and say, oh, poor little me. You think God's pleased with that? Just keep on walking for the Lord in the valley. You don't understand why God sends those, but you keep on walking. Job didn't understand when God took his family or let the devil rather take his family and his health and his wealth and his all gone. And Job had some sorry friends. But you know when God turned his captivity. You know when God blessed him beyond measure. And double what he had when he prayed for those sorry, lousy friends. See what God wants you to do. When people give you a hard time and persecute you, Job's friend said, oh, you've had to sin for all this to happen. But Job forgave him, sorry as they were. And the Bible says God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for those lousy, rotten, accusing friends. They should have been encouraging. Well, you just keep walking through the valley. God's got something beyond the valley for you. And then you praise him in the valley. If you suffer because you're a Christian, just praise the Lord. Now, if you suffer because you took money out of the till at work and you wasn't supposed to or you were loafing on the job, you can't say I'm being persecuted for Jesus. You're being persecuted for doing wrong. But I'm telling you, if you're being persecuted because you're living for God and serving him. Uh, just rejoice. Uh, rejoice you don't have to go to hell. Rejoice that your name is written down in heaven. Rejoice you're counted worthy to suffer for his name. Then I'll give you a fourth thing. Boy, you're going to like this one. Like Wesley Grant, the black preacher of Ice, where you say to his living, he was on TV and he said, I like that. Well, I want to say I like this. Rejoice because salvation it's by grace through faith and not of works. Yeah. If salvation depended on works, now you listen to me tonight, every last one of us here, every man, every woman, every boy and girl would wind up in hell. You know why? Because the Bible says if you break one law, you're guilty of breaking them all. How many of you could live an absolutely perfect life? Years ago, I was in... La Jolla, California, I was in the Navy, and we lived in a little trailer park, and there's a Nazarene lived over across from me. One day he said, preacher, guess what? He said, I'm sanctified. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't sin anymore. I thought, yeah, 
Next day he got out with that old push mower of his and he cranked on it and cranked on it and it wouldn't start and I didn't know that a man full of the Holy Ghost had a vocabulary like he had. He let it rip. I said, buddy, you lost your sanctification real fast. Well, you see, it's by grace uh, through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And the Bible says in Romans 3, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh, no flesh justified in his sight. Thank God. But he said the righteousness of God without the law, without the law, is manifested. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all of them that believe. I got righteous when I trusted Jesus. God put, the <laughs> glory to God, God put the righteousness of Jesus Christ on my account and my sins are gone. And when God sees me and you, they're saying he sees us through the blood, the God of blood. He looks down at you and says, well, I don't see their sin. I don't see where they've missed it. Uh, they're mine. Uh, and thank God, we need to rejoice because salvation is by grace. Plus nothing. Minus nothing. <laughs> thank God it's unmerited favor. And mercy is God holding back what he, we deserve now. Pour down on that. Thank God for mercy and for grace. Glory to God. What grace, accessible grace, bountiful grace, charming grace, dependable grace, experienceable grace, forever grace, great grace. It's helping grace. It's hallelujah grace. It's inclusive grace. It's Jesus grace. It's a loving grace. It's miraculous, marvelous, matchless grace. It's new grace. It's pardoning grace. It's quickening grace, redemptive grace, saving grace, sustaining grace, triumphant grace, unexcelled grace, victorious grace, wondrous grace. Hallelujah. Thank God for that grace. One songwriter said, grace, it's greater than all of my sin. My sins were great, but hallelujah, God's grace is greater. It's far more powerful, far more wonderful. Thank God for the grace of God. And uh, Ralph Sr. used to say, it would make a fellow want to walk up a wall backwards. He had some quaint sayings. I've got a bunch of his sermons. I need to write them down and incorporate them, Brother Tim. Yeah, it makes a man want to walk up a wall backwards. He used to say, it would make a fellow want to run to Goober Town, Arkansas and back. You say, that's a make-believe town. No, there's a town called Goober Town, Arkansas. Well, I'm just simply saying, we ought to rejoice. Thank God. I don't have to go to hell. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I want to say lastly, I, well, I'm rejoicing because Jesus is coming back. Yeah. Our choir sings that song that y'all sang a while ago. I'm glad he's coming back. I'm rejoicing over that. Jesus said, if I go away, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. If that promise doesn't bless you, your blesser's broken, you don't have one. If that doesn't help you, when Jesus said, I'm coming back, much awaits us in the future. I want to say your future is as bright as the promises of God. It's bright, and he came the first time just like the prophet said, but he's coming the second time, and what's going to happen? There's going to be a rapture. Now, I'm going to give you a little quick prophetic overview. There's going to be a rapture. The saints of God's bodies will be changed, and we'll go up to meet the Lord in the air. There's an old song in the red book, it's the next thing to the Bible, the old red back hymn book, that talks about the resurrection, and it says, Graves all bursting, saints all shouting. Well, the saints will be shouting, but I don't believe the graves will be bursting. When Jesus came to those disciples after his resurrection, there was no open door. There was no window to crawl through, but all of a sudden, Jesus appeared in their midst. When the rapture takes place, I don't believe there'll be one clod disturbed in the graveyard, not one. 
which supernaturally will be given that body, those that have died, and up they'll come, and together we'll go up to meet the Lord in there. It'll be instantaneous, faster than a twinkle of an eye. And then there'll be a tribulation period of seven years, three and a half years of peace, three and a half years of judgment, three series of judgments, and total them up, there's 21 judgments that's coming on this earth. It's going to be a time where I'm glad I'm going to be in heaven. Water will turn to blood. Hail stones will fall, weighing 100 pounds and all that. And we'll be in the sky with the Lord. Believers will. God's not appointed us under wrath. He hasn't appointed us under the seal judgments and the trumpet judgment and the bowl of the vile judgment. No, no. A large part of the world's population will die during the last part of the tribulation period. Then there'll be the second coming. Now there's the rapture first of all. Seven years later, there'll be the second coming. Gog and Magog will come together, and according to Revelation 19, they'll gather against God, and they'll be destroyed by the rider on the white horse. I know who that rider is. <laughs> Thank God I met him many years ago in an old-fashioned holder, in a Bible preaching, God worshiping church. I, I met him, uh, and I don't regret it. There's the second coming. And then when that's over, there's going to be a millennial reign. The curse is going to be removed from the earth. How many of you have a garden? Raise your hand. All right. Do you ever find any thorns in your garden? Do you know why those thorns are there? They're there because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and we have to pull thorns out of our gardens. Oh, my. And it'll be a time of peace. The devil's going to be chained for a thousand years. Brother, if that doesn't make somebody shout, I don't know what to give. For a thousand years, during the millennial reign, the devil's going to, I'm talking about reasons to rejoice. I'll be in the sky. Hallelujah. I'll not go through all of that tribulation. But then there's going to be that millennial reign. The devil will be loosed at the end of 1,000 years. And then there'll be the final war of all wars. And it'll become to battle, and the Lord will exercise authority and destroy those enemies. It'll be a time of peace. You know what? The animals will lose their ferociousness. Brother Tim, have you ever looked lately at a picture of a tiger? They're beautiful. They're about to get extinct because people are killing them, taking their hides off themselves. You know, I won't hear them when you rain a pet tiger. Aren't they pretty? Now, you'll not get one in my house now. I got a double barrel salt. Oh, I'm not supposed to tell that. But anyhow, uh, uh, he's not going to get in my yard now. But when they lose their ferociousness, when they begin to eat vegetables instead of flesh, I want a pet tiger. I'll put that thing on a leash and walk around and say, look at my pet. Hey, man, the millennial reign. And then Satan will permanently be confined to the lake of fire. I'm glad Jesus is coming back. And that's what keeps me going and preaching and living because I believe his promise. He said, I will come again. Amen. To be honest with you, I get tired of all the sin I see. You feel that way? I get tired of the conflict. There is a dishonesty there is in the world. And tired of seeing people glorify and magnify what God says is an abomination. I get tired of that. But better days are ahead. <laughs> Billy Kelly used to preach, the best is yet to come. And that's true for the child of God. Rejoice because you don't have to go to hell. Rejoice because if you're saved, your name's in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice because you're able to suffer for the Lord. Rejoice because your salvation is by grace through faith. And rejoice because Jesus is coming back. I've told people Jesus is coming back, and they say, well, where is that promise? I said, it's right here. It's in this Bible. It's right here in this inspired, inerrant, an infallible word of God. And I'm glad you're a King James Version church. A lot of people don't realize it, and I'm going to get in a lot of that, but 
these modern versions come from inferior manuscripts, come out of Egypt and came out of the, uh, out of the Catholic monastery. But our Bible, I thank God for it, and I'm going to stay by it, and I'm preaching this old King James Version till the day I die. <laughs> instead of being sad, instead of being negative and overcome, Realize what I've given you tonight. Let God fill your heart up with his glory and let the hallelujahs roll and wave those hands. Uh, let those tears flow. Give those shouts because everything he promised and said is so. Let God saturate you so much with himself and his truths that you can get to can't help it and shout. Heard somebody say one time, hold my baby while I shout. That shout wouldn't mean very much, would it? But I tell you, if it's spontaneous, if it's real, it's a help to a church. It's a blessing to others. Enjoy your salvation and let the love you have for Jesus overcome all of your problems and live for him. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Let me recap it. Rejoice because you don't have to go to hell. Rejoice because your name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Rejoice because you're able to suffer. Rejoice because salvation is by grace through faith and rejoice because Jesus is coming back. Let me ask you, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? I tell you, I don't know what all is going to happen. I read my Bible, but I wouldn't take a chance on being left behind. When Jesus comes for his church, the Bible said there's going to be a strong delusion. People are going to believe the lie that the Antichrist is God. They're going to have a delusion. But I tell you, now's the time to get right. Now's the time to get saved. Now's the time to embrace the promises of God and say, I believe God no matter what society says or what Dr. Doodle Digger says, I'm going to believe God. Hallelujah. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.